audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. We're driving down the highway and apparently a construction company had left a guardrail overlapping into the highway and our driver was coming up on that at 70 miles an hour and he couldn't swerve because a car was in the lane next to him. So he ends up hitting it at 70 miles an hour and it literally tears the side of the van open. And apparently while I'm asleep, I came out of that hole on the side of the van at 70 miles an hour and I woke up sliding down the road on my back. I didn't know what was happening. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, former rock star tour manager Kelly Kay was living his dream in the music industry, rubbing shoulders with the big names in the business and travelling all over the world. However, that all came to a crashing halt, quite literally, when the tour van he was sleeping in was in an horrific accident and he almost lost his life. It was then that Kelly Kay turned back to Jesus and he's gone on to write best-selling devotional books. We'll hear how it all happened as he shares his story with us today. Kelly is chatting with Eric Scadabo. Kelly Kay, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So glad to have you with us. And where are you joining us from today? Man, I am all the way in Kingfisher, Oklahoma right now. And I know you're going to ask, where is that? And I have no idea myself. (laughs) You don't know where you are? (laughs) I'm right in the middle of the state, right in the middle of the United States. Like, you can't get any more middle than where we are right now. Okay, and Kelly K is the name you go by. What is your actual name? Yeah, so my name is Kelly Cop with a K. So if I was a policeman, that means I'd be Officer Cop. Oh, there but, you uh, go. <laughs> I've, been going by, yeah, I've been going by Kelly K for a long time, so we, we just keep that. Okay. That's a good ring to it. And so you are a former rock star tour manager. What kind of groups did you rub shoulders with? So I, I worked with bands like Nickelback, Three Days Grace, Breaking Benjamin, Seether, Red. Um, I was the stage manager for Warp Tour for a while. So out there, you know, it was Paramore, uh, Kill Switch Engage, uh, all, all the big punk bands. So if there was a big band in the early 2000s, I was probably with them at some point. Okay, I'm getting a little old. All I recognized was Nickelback. <laughs> well, this may help you. So I'm actually still the current tour manager for Wang Chung. Oh, is that you remember right? Wang Chung, yes, right? Yes, of course. Everybody have fun tonight? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Every time they, they come to the U.S. every summer, and I still go out and tour with them. Okay. Um, but I see it more as a, uh, a mission field now than a rock star party like I used to back oh. in the day. All right. Uh, well, we're going to talk yeah, about so. that change in your life. Uh, but let's first go back to where it all started. Where were you born and raised? I was actually born right here in Kingfisher, Oklahoma, where okay. I am right now. Uh, uh-huh. Never thought I'd come back here, but... Here I am. So I was born and raised right here, Oklahoma. Okay. And what kind of family did you grow up in? Yeah, I grew up in a very godly home. And my family was, uh, if the doors of the church were open, we were there. My dad was a drummer at our church. Um, I don't know anybody who loves like Jesus more than my mom did. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, I, I was really blessed to, I don't ever remember not knowing about God. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yep. My entire life. I mean, I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I was nine years old. I experienced a radical healing when I was 10 years old. So I just, I grew up immersed uh, just in the presence of God in that. And that's quite amazing. It really is. And did you stay close to God through your teenage years? Uh, I wish I could say yes, but I think the the problem is, is that when you're around that so much, you can become numb to it, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and in my whole life growing up, that's all that I've known was that we, we do what the Bible says. We we seek God, we trust God. So when I got into my teenage year, especially, you know, graduating high school, I, I didn't ever doubt or not believe in God, but I got to a point where I wanted to do what I wanted. And the way God wanted me to live, it went counter to everything I wanted to do. So I got to this point where I, I was actually a youth pastor right out of high school, and I was preaching to all these kids, and we had grown the youth group from like seven kids to 70 kids, and I realized everything I was preaching, I wasn't living. Hmm. And so I went to the pastor. I mean, that, it really hit me hard. Like, Kelly, hmm. you're telling these kids how to live, and you're not living that way. So I went and resigned that night, and I just told the pastor, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to. I, 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 I've read the Bible enough to know that if you teach the word, you're going to be held to a much higher uh, standard than yep. everybody else. And I didn't want that. So I just quit. And I decided, I told God, hey, I, I know who you are, but I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to live my own life. Uh, I just wanted to pursue rock and roll more than anything, which looking back was horrible decision. Mm. But, um, 
But that's where you were at at that point. Yeah. And he's so good and faithful that he knew what was coming. He knew I was going to turn back around. So thankfully, he never left me, but I tried to leave him for a Mm -hmm. period of time. Now, another trend in your life, correct me if I'm wrong, but from a young age, you always had this desire to be a performer and be in front of people. Is that right? Yeah, I, I can't. And I think that it goes back to my my parents, my dad and my birth mom. Um, they got divorced before I was one year old. And I didn't even know I had another mom till I was about nine or 10. Um, and my mom and I have a great relationship now, but there was this the sense of being abandoned, this feeling mm-hmm. of somebody didn't want me. I was mm-hmm. rejected. Mm-hmm. And everything I did after that was, I want you to like me. I want you to, I, I want to be important to you. So I thought if I became famous, the whole world would like me. And that's, that was for me, that was the ultimate goal. I didn't, I don't care about money. I didn't care about anything else. Just, I want to be famous. I want everyone to know my name. And in my opinion, the best way to do that was in rock and roll, was through music. You know, that's all I'd ever really known was music. I was a musician myself, so I thought that's how I was going to achieve that. Oh, so your desire to be in front of people wasn't born from a desire to show your talent as an entertainer or an actor, but it was born out of a a desire for people-pleasing. Right. That's that's 100% what it was. And, And my whole life had been that way. I mean... Even now, I still struggle with a bit of that. I just want to make people happy. I want what every interaction I have, I want you to to walk away with a smile on your face. I want to impact your day. Now, luckily, now I'm doing it in a little more healthy way. I still mm-hmm. struggle some. But back then, it was very unhealthy. And I would do whatever it took to be the center of attention. Okay. And we should say that at a young age, you felt called by God. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's true as well. So when I was 13 years old, uh, I went to a, a church camp, a summer camp. And while I was at that camp, I mean, I heard the voice of God. It's probably the first time in my life I really heard the voice of God. And he told me that I was supposed to travel the world and preach the gospel. He told me I was going to preach in arenas. But I remember I didn't know what to do with that at 13, though, right? Like at a 13-year-old kid, what do you do with that? So I've always known that. That's been heavy on my heart. I just didn't know what to do with it. Okay, so... Just tracking your story, you know you're called by God for big things. But then yeah. from 13 to late teens, all of a sudden you're like, no, God, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I mean, I really did try to to follow him. But at the same time, I never really gave him everything. I still had my wants and my desires. I was just trying to drag God with me through what I wanted to do. You know, when Jesus gives us a call, he says, follow me. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say, bring me with you. And that, that's where I missed it. I wasn't following him. I was still doing what I wanted and trying to make him fit into my world. Well, the problem is God's world and in our world don't mix. You've got to make a choice. And I hadn't done that. So by the time I was 18 or 19, yes, I knew I had this call of God on my life, but I didn't care because I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a celebrity. And his plan, was that sounded well and great, but I'm making his name famous if I'm doing that. I wanted my name to be famous. Oh, so... The way that looked in practical reality in your life was you went into a punk rock group and wanted to be famous that way? Yeah, I started playing in in punk bands. This was, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. So pop punk was really uh, a big thing. And I was way into it. So I had started um, this punk band and we were traveling all over the country doing the thing. The problem was our band was wildly mediocre. (laughs) We're just... Middle of the road, you know, I mean, I'm a good musician. We were all good musicians. The problem was there was a million that were better than us. So we were trying to to get famous. It just wasn't happening. And then I remember one day my drummer called and said that uh, his wife had gotten pregnant. He was out of the band. And then my bass player said, well, if he's out, I'm out. I'm moving back to Kansas. And I just realized one day I was all alone. I had no band. Um, I wasn't famous. I was broke, living in an apartment, you know. And uh, this this wasn't working. But the good news is, is that while trying to make it as a famous musician, I had made a lot of connections in the music industry. Mm -hmm. I had uh, contacts now with some really big people um, on the business side of music. So my mind goes, okay, Kelly, you're probably not going to make it as a famous rock star yourself. But the next closest thing would be to be with those guys, right? I figured, mm-hmm. hey, if you know them, there may be a chance to get in and play later. You just need to know the right people. So what I did, this is no joke. When my band fell apart, I reached out to one of these managers 
two of them actually, they worked for the same company in the same office. And I started to call them every single day for six months straight. And every day I called and asked them if they would give me a job um, working in their management company. I mean, they manage Nickelback, Cinderella, mm-hmm. Saliva. They had some of the biggest. I, I take men. it these are big groups. <laughs> Absolutely, they are. Yeah. I recognize Nickelback. And, uh, <laughs> Hey, that's all. Hey, that's all right. If you know them, you you know you know the caliber. So they're thinking, oh, not not that guy again. Exactly. I guarantee that's what it was. You know, every day I would call, and they would always say, like, you know, who are you again? Or where'd you go to school? You know, what's your degree in? I'm like, well, I didn't go to school, but I know rock and roll. That's what I kept telling them. I know rock and roll, guys. Yeah. I know rock and roll. And they're like, you know, how many people want this job that have gone to school for seven years or four? You know, yeah. and, and why would we give it to you? And but every day I called and asked every, I was just relentless. And my family told me I was crazy. My friends told me I was crazy. And then finally, after six months of doing this, my lease was up on my apartment and I was going to have to move. So I made a really bold step and I, I made my normal daily call. But this time I didn't say, can I come work for you? Will you give me a job? I called and I said, Hey, I tell you what, I'm selling everything I own and I'm going to come work for you for free. I was like, you don't have to okay. pay me a dime. I'm just yeah. going to come and I'm going to show you I know rock and roll. And they were like, what? And they they said, we'll, we'll call you back. And I remember they called me back that evening. And one of the guys said, all right, you can sleep on my couch. If you want to wow. come work for free, I'll let you sleep here. Come on. And so that's what wow. I did. I sold everything I had. I ended up with one suitcase and $5,000. And I literally hitchhiked to uh, to Texas where their op- where that office was. They had about seven offices, but that was the closest one to me. Mm-hmm. And I hitchhiked there and uh, jumped out of the truck, went into this guy's house, and uh, that was it. I worked for them for free for three months. And at the end of three months, they fired both of their assistants and gave me their jobs. Oh, wow. And then three months after that, they put me on the road as a tour manager with some of the biggest bands in the world. Wow. Uh, I was just that dedicated to this cause and to rock and roll. I knew, I knew. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you know, that's fantastic success. And you. <laughs> obviously you were overjoyed but what do you think it was yeah. about you that made you better than the people who were working there you know the thing is is i'm not better than you know who am i better than we're all we're all the same working for the same thing right the difference is is that most people aren't consistent most people give up most mm. people quit and uh that wasn't in my vocabulary i was not going to quit i mean I, i'd still be calling them today i think <laughs> you know 20 years later had they and they kept saying no. And I think that's what set it apart is they thought if this guy has this much drive just to get here, what could he do for us with that much drive? And uh, that's what it took. Because when I got in there with their assistants, their assistants were trying to just be as lazy as possible, right? Just try to get, do as little work as possible and just get through the day. In those first three months of me being there, they also had a record label. And I found like five or six bands that we were interviewing, trying to bring onto our record label that I had went and just hunted them down myself. So really, it's just that drive and determination, I think, is what set me apart. You're listening to The Story. Today, Eric Scadabo is chatting with former rock star tour manager Kelly Kay. We just heard how he broke into the music industry. Next, we'll hear how it all comes to a crashing halt, quite literally when he was in a horrific accident where he almost lost his life. All that and more is coming up when we return. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax, and this is The Story. Our guest today is former rock star tour manager Kelly Kay. Before the break, we heard how he finally broke into the rock music industry through perseverance and sheer determination. Now we'll hear what happened next in his life as he continues his chat with Eric Scadabo. And so that started off well. Yeah, it started off really good. And, uh, you know, and and then they, they put me on the road. And then I was kind of living the dream at this point. You know, we're doing 20, 30, 40,000 seat arenas every night. You know, there's full catering. Everything you want is paid for. You know, you're making a, a lot of money. Yeah, this was everything you were looking for. It, it was, yeah, it was it was all right there. I mean, everywhere I went, when you wear that badge on your side that shows you're with that tour and it says all access, man, I don't care where you go, 
you're treated like a celebrity. They don't know if you're in the band or yeah. if you're a crew member or tour manager or what. You know, wherever you go, people would just bow to you, give you whatever you wanted. And yeah, it, it felt really good. I could see that becoming a bit addicting in a sense. That's why you see guys that do this their whole life, man. You'll see guys 65 years old out there tuning guitars on the side of a stage because <laughs> you live in this fairy tale. It's not yeah. real life. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah, so I was enjoying that. So one would think that's it. This is Nirvana for yeah. you, so to speak. Another band. Uh, <laughs> I know them. So what happened? Why aren't you still doing that? Yeah, so uh, I'm out living the dream, living this life, thinking I'm going to do this forever. And uh, I was out with the band Red at the time, which you, you may know them. They're a Christian rock band. And this was during their first tour, uh, End of Silence. Can, can I, just, we can I been... just interrupt here? Because this was a thought that came across yeah. my mind as I'm hearing you tell your story. You had this Christian upbringing, but you also liked rock stars. Was there never the thought of maybe I could combine the two and be a Christian rock star or a Christian manager? I'm just wondering where um, that came in. At this point in my life, I, I had walked so far away from God that I wasn't really interested. Um, I was so just your lifestyle so was very, very not Christian. Not Yeah. I mean, if you had met me, you wouldn't know that I knew anything about God at all. There was nothing godly about my life. Yeah, so that's how far you'd yeah, walked away from yeah. your upbringing and your early yeah. faith. Okay. For so, sure. So this secular company is managing Christian groups too? So yeah, so they had one guy, one manager who was in that office and that he managed Christian bands. So he had, you know, Red, Grits, Pillar, uh, a lot of the really big Christian rock bands at that time. So he was in the same office as the guy that managed Nickelback, okay. Saliva, Poison, Cinder, all of that. So they're they're yeah. managed in the same office as the secular groups. That's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I always thought it was kind of like a ministry, but it's more like a business. For That's some what of I was going to say. It should be a ministry, but unfortunately, it just turns into a business as well. Huh. And, uh, and not for that manager. So I'm actually that manager is actually my current manager now. Was oh, that right? As an author and as a speaker, who the guy who used to manage Christians, he is an amazing, godly man. He's the real deal, 100. Okay. percent And I'm so glad that we've we've stayed close. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, for some, it's not like that. Mm. Music. Christian music can turn into a business and a job as well. Sad mm. as, as it is. Yeah. But so, yeah, so I'm out with red. I, I'm, I'm out with them doing the end of silence tour. We've been renting a Prevo, which is a tour bus. That's one of the brands. That's the main one everybody uses. And uh, it was really expensive renting it. So we decided to buy our own. So we bought one, but there was going to be a two day gap from when we returned the rented Prevo before we could pick up our new one that we bought. So we, we rented a uh, 15 passenger van to do these two shows on. So we're finishing the second show, which was in North Carolina, and we're about to drive back to Nashville to pick up our bus. And uh, I'm asleep in the very back seat of this van. Now we've been driving like 16 hours and we are literally 20 minutes away from Nashville, from picking up our bus. I'm asleep in the back seat and I wake up. Now this is normal. I normally wake up every morning around this time. It was around six o'clock. And now normally I would get up, put my, uh, my headphones on, you know, get on my computer, start working, whatever. That was every single day I did that. Well, this day I woke up and for whatever reason, I decided to go back to sleep. But before I did, I took off my hoodie and I laid on my, on my back, which is very weird because I'm a stomach sleeper. It also takes me a long time to fall asleep. And on this day, I fell back asleep instantly. Very weird, right? Mm -hmm. About 10 minutes after all of that took place, we're driving down the highway and apparently a construction company had left a guardrail overlapping into the highway and cars were normally swerving around it. But at 6 a.m. traffic in Nashville, all the roads were just jam packed and our driver was coming up on that at 70 miles an hour and he couldn't swerve because a car was in the lane next to him. So he ends up hitting it at 70 miles an hour and it literally tears the side of the van open. Oh, just wow. imagine a can and a can opener. Yeah, it just yeah. shredded it. Mm -hmm. And I, I apparently while I'm asleep, I came out of that hole on the side of the van at 70 miles an hour oh, wow. and I woke up sliding down the road on my back. I didn't know what was happening. When I woke up, I thought I was on fire. I was oh. in a full scream, screaming at the top of my lungs. And all I knew was I'm burning. I'm wow. burning alive. Yeah. And then finally, when I stopped sliding, I realized what happened. I wasn't on fire. I'd come out of the van. Um, I'm laying on the ground with a truck, literally over me, like the two wheels in the air over me. And our trailer had come off from the hitch and come to the same side of the road I was on and a truck hit that trailer instead of hitting me. And there I am laying on the ground. Oh, wow. Here's what's crazy though. 
when the paramedics get there and they start investigating the scene, the situation, mm-hmm. yeah, they they told me they said, Kelly, had you been awake, you probably would have died. If you'd have tried to brace or you know locked your tightened your body up at all, going through this metal, it would have slit your throat. It would have killed you. Oh, wow. they said, Kelly, had you had your hoodie on? I took my hoodie off right before I went back to sleep. I never took that thing off. They said, had you had that on, it would have got caught in the metal and thrown you underneath the van and you'd be dead. Oh, wow. They said, had I been laying on my stomach, which I sleep on my stomach, yeah. I had this huge cut in my head. They said that cut, had I been on my stomach, would have slit my throat, would have killed me. Oh, so literally, yeah. God wakes me up, yeah. has me do these three or four things that every one of them completely saved my life that mm-hmm. day. Had that trailer gone to the other side, that truck would have run me over. I'm telling you, God's hand was on this thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, hindsight's yeah. 2020. Looking yeah. back, God was protecting me big time that day but that day man that's that's probably one of the most important days in my life because that day changed everything um that ended my my touring right then i spent the next three months in and out of burn centers Mm -hmm. um having my back rebuilt and re-put back together i had ptsd so bad um from being in vehicles that there's no way i could sleep in a car let alone a tour bus ever again so it it kind of it just it it changed everything so Literally, this whole dream you had came to a crashing halt. Yeah. What happened? What are you thinking? Are you mad at God? Happy at God? What are you thinking inside? Man, I'll be real honest with you. It would, I would love to have this be the moment in the story where I say, and I turned right back to God, and he changed my life, and everything was easy ever since. But th- that's not what happened. What happened was, while I'm going through this healing and recovery process, mm-hmm. I start to think back about when God called me when I was 13 Mm -hmm. to be a preacher and I'm supposed to travel. And then I started to think back over the last few years while I was touring and all that, I could still hear the voice of God telling me, Kelly, I have a plan for you. I'm waiting for you. And I had just been ignoring that voice. So once this crash happens, my first thought, and I'm telling you, this is a backwards way of thinking. It is the wrongest. I should not have thought this way. If you're out there watching, listening, this is wrong. All right. Don't let this happen to you. Right. My first thought was, Kelly, you're death proof. You can't die, bro. If God had, I thought, if God has a call and plan for my life, he's going to see it happen. So until it happens, you're you're invincible. That was, I really thought that. Wow. I thought I can live however I want because God has a plan for me. And until I fulfill it, Nothing can hurt me. How how ridiculous is that? That is a, a different spin on feeling called, I have to admit. <laughs> right? Not a good spin. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, I was a very selfish, you know, person. I was mm-hmm. always self-seeking, you know, I want to be famous. It's all about me. Mm-hmm. So it, t- it makes total sense in my mind why I would think that. I, I'm God's gift to the world, you know, that that's, I God's going to wait for me. They're so lucky to have me. <laughs> that, exactly. That's, I mean, that's really where I was. Yeah. That's the place that I was at in my life. And so what, what happened from there, you know, I'm out of the music industry now. I'd lost everything that I thought I had built up for, Yeah. but I still wanted to be famous. I still had that yearning for fulfillment, for people to love me. I want to be loved. I want people to like me. So uh, I said, all right, how else can I be famous? So I came up with an idea for a TV show. Okay, well, we'll have to stop it right there as we've run out of time for today's program. But we invite you to join us again next time for part two of Eric Scatterbo's chat with former rock star tour manager Kelly Kay. And we'll find out how Kelly eventually submits to God's calling on his life. That's all coming up next time. But for right now, I just have to say that Kelly's life reminds me a bit of Jonah's life in the Bible. Both of them knew that they were called by God for a specific purpose. And both of them rebelled against that purpose and tried their best to go the other way. Fortunately, God did not give up on Jonah or Kelly Kay, and both of them eventually submitted to God's will for their lives. Well, how about you? Are you rebelling against God and his call on your life? Why not turn to him today and seek his will for your life? If you'd like to pray with someone about this, our prayer line is 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's one 800 772 Nine three six. A member of our prayer team would love to pray with you on that number again, one 800 936 Well, until next time, when we'll hear part two of Kelly Kay's remarkable story, I'm Jimmy Colfax encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Next time on The Story. In 2016, I made a video called Is It a Sin to Get a Tattoo? That video did over 3 million views 
in the first week and my phone started ringing off the hook from churches, pastors, camps, conferences, people saying, hey, will you come speak at this? Will you come speak at this? And it was crazy because God showed me, he said, look, Kelly, the thing that kept you out of churches, the tattoos and the way you look, he said, that's the same thing I use to put you in churches. Once again, former rock star tour manager Kelly Kay joins us to share how his life was completely turned around after he was in a horrific accident and almost died. Also, he'll share how he eventually began to write best-selling devotional books. All that and more is coming up next time. The Story. Just another way Vision is helping you look to God daily. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 